it. Matthew 5, 9. Jesus says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So, I want to take a survey this morning, okay? So participate with me, if you will. How many of you think we need peace in the world? Raise your hand. He's looking around like, what's everyone else saying? (laughs) Okay, okay. Now, how many of you have actually put some deep thought into how we can bring peace to the world? Couple people. I believe if you asked any Christian, well, any person really in the world, if they desired peace on earth, they would say, yes, of course. But let's just talk about Christians for a minute. The Barner Group did a survey and found that just over 50% of professing Christians say they shared their faith with someone else, someone else at least once in the last year. Only half of us statistically share our faith at least once. in in a given calendar year. But we all want peace, right? You all raised your hand. We want peace. But we don't do the work of peacemaking. Or at least we do it like once a year, half of us. The church is not lacking in preachers. We're not lacking in programs. We're not lacking in buildings. What we're lacking is peacemakers. Men and women who orient their whole lives around the mission of the Prince of Peace, which is this, to make disciples of all nations and baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that Jesus has commanded. Our Christianity has to be more than just Sunday morning attendance. It has to be a 24-7 commitment to peacemaking. That's what he said. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons, children of God. We're living in a broken world. Billions of men and women have a broken relationship with God. And until peace is made between God and man, the brokenness in the world can never be mended. It won't ever be mended until there's peace with God. And we have the gospel of peace. That's what the Bible calls it, the gospel of peace peace, the message of Christ, which brings holistic peace and mending to the brokenness that we all see and experience. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they shall be called sons of God. So let me just, uh, why is this sound? Oh, it's my beard. Sorry. I got it like, okay. So let's focus on this first half of the sentence. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peace is a word we throw around without much thought uh, anymore. Like every time I say bye to you, it's like peace out. Like what does that even mean, peace out? I'm going to stop saying that because it's kind of stupid. But biblical peace is more meaningful. It carries a picture of hope. The the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. The word peace means more than just the opposite of war. It's more than just the opposite of trouble. Biblical peace is a holistic term. Shalom is perfect harmony and balance in all creation. From the birds that we see flying in the air all the way to the family in the home. Shalom covers all of creation. And it flows out from who Christ is. Look at how Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 describes Jesus. It's like the Christmas passage everybody likes to preach from. Isaiah says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and he finishes with Prince of Shalom, Prince of Peace. It means that the very essence and nature of God is peace, it's Shalom. In him we see the perfection of all things harmonious and balanced and good. If someone were to say, show me peace, all you'd have to do is point to Jesus and say, there it is. There's peace. There's shalom. There's what it looks like. There's no more perfect depiction of shalom than what we see in the Trinity, in the Father, the Son, in the Spirit. The harmonious perfection between all of them. The perfect oneness within the three persons. 
The definition of shalom in Isaiah 9, 6 is this, harmonious relations, freedom from disputes. He's the, he's the prince of harmonious relationships and freedom from disputes. Harmonious, this word comes from the word harmony. I'm like educating you guys big time here. Which is a musical term describing what happens when all types of different sounds come together in perfect unity. And although these are all separate sounds, they become one and it's, it's perfect. It's, it's balanced. It's harmonious. That's what shalom is. It's harmony in all creation. God is the great orchestrator. He's the conductor of this harmony. And it all flows from him, his peace. And without God, without Christ, peace is impossible. It can't exist. So when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, what he's saying at a fundamental level is, happy and blessed are those of you who orient your life and who live for me on mission to bring peace between God and man. He that wins souls is wise. Remember that phrase because I'm going to repeat it a lot. The problem is that we live in a world of sin, and sin leads to brokenness. The shalom of God seems more like a fantasy world. Like you're probably hearing me preach and go, man, this, this isn't what I see. It's nice, but it's not what I see. It's not what I live. It's not what I feel. Something has gone terribly wrong in our world because it's broken. The reason we experience war and violence and chaos is because of sin. Sin leads to brokenness, period. That's, 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 that's what the problem is. Lasting shalom cannot reign where sin is. The reality is we're all a bunch of broken people living in a broken world trying to figure out how we can repair our broken souls. I don't think there's anybody on the planet today who would look at the state of the world and say, you know what, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. No, it is broke. It's very broke. How do we fix it? There's a unanimous and obvious truth. We're broken. So what's the solution? Well, one way we try is with self-help. Anybody ever read some self-help books? I turned to self-help in my late teenage years, in my early 20s. And the gospel of self-help is basically... With enough effort and enough belief in your own innate goodness, you can accomplish anything. The good news of self-help is me. Surprise, surprise, self-help is self-centered. You see, you're not broken. You're just trying to operate this machine without plugging it in. So just plug into your own goodness. Like Realize how awesome you are, and then you're going to soar to heights you never thought possible. So what self-help tells us. I uh, heard some stuff when I was in the self-help uh, circles there. They'd say stuff like, follow your heart. You know, find your true self. That's lousy advice. Because I tried and I found him and he wasn't good. No, 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 no. The problem with these philosophies of man and these solutions and religions of, religions of man is it ignores the real problem. Listen, the answer is not inside of you. The problem is you. Look all you want inside. You're not going to find the solution. You're just going to find more brokenness and more problems. Sin leads to brokenness, and unless we realize that, we're going to remain broken and we will never fulfill the word of the Lord to be peacemakers. The reason shalom was shattered in the universe was not because Adam and Eve neglected their own innate goodness. It was because they sinned against the one and only and holy God. Like God didn't find Adam in the garden hiding and say, Adam, do you have low self-esteem? Is that why you're hiding? That's not what happened. He said, Adam, have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Adam, have you sinned? Sin is the thing that shatters peace because there can be no peace where sin is. Sin is the breaking of God's law. It's the opposite of shalom. It shatters harmony. If sin were music, it would be the sounds of bones breaking and a crescendo of nails on a chalkboard ugly. 
Because of sin, our relationship with God is broken. And when that relationship is broken, so is everything else. We need to be reconciled, made right with God. We need peace between us and him. And that's why he that wins souls, or she that wins souls, is wise. So then biblical peace is repairing and bringing reconciliation to that which was broken. It's making whole what was fractured. And the solution is not self-help. The solution, it's not trying more. The solution is not in you. It's outside of you. It's Christ. Jesus came into a broken world to bring repair and reconciliation. And the cost of the reconciliation was his own blood, his own life. This good news that Jesus died and rose from the dead, it's our main and only peacemaking strategy. It's our only weapon. It's him. We can feed all the poor. We can get everyone in, in, into a good middle class job. But if shalom isn't restored between God and man, we're just putting band-aids on dead corpses. Despite what our politicians want to tell us, the problem is not lack of jobs or poverty or health care or foreign relations. The problem is we're broken, we're sinners, and God is holy. All of these problems would disappear overnight if mankind had peace with God. We can't treat the symptoms. We have to treat the cause. We have to take the ax and put it to the roots. The cause is sin. The solution is Christ. So he that wins souls is wise. So then, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about what peacemaking is not. Peacemaking is not ignoring a problem or enabling someone in destructive behavior because they might get mad at you if you confront them. That's not peacemaking. Peacemaking is not making everyone feel good about themselves. That's not peacemaking. Peacemaking is not self-esteem building or counseling. Ultimately, the peace that Jesus is talking about here is peace between God and man. To be a peacemaker in the context of what Jesus is talking about explicitly is to be one who's committed their whole life to him and to bring reconciliation and harmonious relationships between God and man. So Jesus is our pattern. He came to make peace. He was our divine mediator. When Christ died, he not only appeased the wrath of God for us, he, he, he bought for us favor, a right relationship with him. To be a peacemaker is to join God on his mission. It's fulfilling this word. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you until the end of the age. Always to the end of the age. When I was in the New Age self-help phase of my life, I remember writing a mission statement for my life. They would encourage you, like, write a mission, mission statement for your life and put it over your bed and, like, read it all the time. And I don't even remember what it was, but it was something like, my mission is to make a lot of money and blah, 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 stuff like that. This is the mission statement for the believer in Jesus Christ. This is it. You don't have to conjure something up. It's already there. Jesus didn't save you just for you. He saved you to join his mission. He saved you to win souls. When I was in grade school, we had this program called the Peacemakers. Anybody have that in school, Peace, the Peacemakers? Probably has a more like politically correct term now, but every school has something like this. Basically what happens is you take an anti-bullying course, and once you pass, you're officially a peacemaker. And these kids would walk around the, the schoolyard with these big orange bands on their arms that said PEACEMAKER in all caps. Their duty was to go around the playground to stop fights and conflicts. They were basically just glorified tattletales. That's what they were. So, because I was a troublemaker... I would constantly be confronted by the peacemakers. One time I even got into like a physical fight with one of them, and I gave the peacemaker legit a Stone Cold Stunner. I actually did. I pulled it off. It didn't hurt him, though, because it, the move makes no sense, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> the goal of peacemakers at my school was not to make peace, it was just to stop trouble. That was it. 
I'm afraid this is too often what the church is trying to do. We're so busy being the societal tattletales that we neglect the real issue, that we're broken. As the church of Jesus Christ, we have the gospel. We have the good news. We have the cure for the brokenness. And instead of wielding this good news like the powerful sword that it is, we hide it in our sheath and we act like schoolyard babble mouths. Our mandate is to bring the shalom of Christ into conflict with the brokenness caused by sin, to bring the reconciliating power of the gospel where there is brokenness. 2 Corinthians 5.20 makes this plea sternly and, and plainly. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Reconciliation is the mending of the brokenness into shalom. It brings peace between God and man, and this ought to be our life's mission because it's Jesus' life mission. He or she that wins souls is wise. You know, do you know why I keep saying that? He or she that wins souls is wise. It seems a little bit out of place. Wisdom is knowledge applied. We have a lot of smart and intelligent people here amongst us in the world in the church but not many wise people anybody can learn knowledge but not everyone can take that knowledge and apply it in wisdom the reason I keep saying he or she that wins souls is wise is because we all have the knowledge we all know the gospel we all have knowledge about the Lord Jesus Christ yes 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 okay Alan I know Every week we come here and you tell us the same thing. Jesus died for your sins and he rose from the dead. Okay, can't we move on from that? No, <laughs> you can't. Number one, there is no moving on from it. And number two, even if you could move on to it, why would we? Because we're not applying it. So we obviously don't get it yet, do we? We have the knowledge, but are we applying it? We all know that the world is going to hell. We all know countless loved ones who, if they died today, would split hell wide open. We know people who are lost. We have the knowledge of the saving work of Jesus Christ that can set them free, but are we wise with the knowledge? Have we applied it? I'm convinced there's nothing worth doing Nothing worth doing with this vaporous life I have than joining Jesus Christ on his peacemaking mission. Nothing else is worth doing. What's the point? With the knowledge I have about God and the gospel, not committing myself to being a peacemaker on, on mission with him would be the most absolutely selfish and hateful thing I could do. Like, like what we're telling people is my financial prosperity, my comfort, my job, my hobbies are more important than your soul. That's what we tell people when we live for ourselves, when we live for pleasure, when we live for entertainment and neglect the mission of God. I, what we're telling people is I would rather submerge myself in, in crappy television programs than labor to win your soul. That's what we're saying with our lifestyles a lot of times. There's no greater happiness in life. I haven't experienced any greater happiness. Now, like my wife is going to give birth to some kids, and it might beat this, but I don't think it will. I don't think there's any greater happiness or joy in life than when I see a sinner repent and turn to Christ. Like, that's a high you don't come down from. It, it's such a glorious thing that the Bible says, all of heaven rejoices when that happens. There's no greater blessing than winning a soul for Jesus Christ. There's no greater happiness than plundering hell to populate heaven. Blessed are the soul winners because those who win souls are wise. Second half of Jesus' sentence here. For they shall be called sons of God. This last half is very telling. If you're committed to shalom restoring to the mission of Christ Jesus, you shall be a child of God. Now, the opposite of that is also true. 
If you're not a peacemaker, it can be said, you are not a child of God. Charles Spurgeon said this. I've used this quote many times here. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. That's it. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. You can't receive the gift of salvation and think you can just keep it to yourself. Jesus doesn't call us to a private faith. He demands a public witness. He demands a public peacemaking. He died in public. He rose again in public. Everything he did was wide open in the public, not hidden, not in a corner. Unfortunately, in today's Canada, freedom of speech is becoming less and less of a virtue. We have high-level politicians, like even our own prime minister, pushing stuff like, you know, okay, you can be a Christian, that's fine, but just keep it at home, keep it at church, don't, 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 don't bring it into the public life, and then we'll be cool. The world tells us, sure, sure, be a Christian, but keep it to yourself. It would be like saying, hey, I know you love your wife, I know you love your kids, I know you love your family, but when we're making decisions, keep that private. You know, if something's going to hurt them, don't worry about it. You can't use your love for them to make decisions. Absurd. It's, it's tyrannical to suggest something like that. In, in the day we live in, we, we have to be even more vigilant, more public with the gospel. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's why we meet here. That's why we meet here. Because it's public. It's open. People can hear me. Hello. See, they can hear me out there. That's why we meet here, because we want people to know Jesus is Lord, because they ain't coming to us. It has to be public. We have to be vigilant. Because the world we live in, the line of distinction between a true child of God and the false is becoming more sharply visible. One of the most obvious markers is this beatitude. Are you a peacemaker? Like, is your life sold out for the mission that Jesus' life was crushed to accomplish. Look, not all of us are like evangelists. Like, we don't all have that gift to just walk up to anybody and, and, and share the gospel. I get it. Not all of us are preachers, but all of us are commanded to be peacemakers. There's something all of us can do to further this mission. Because if not, then can we call ourselves children of God? Because Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called children of God. One thing I know for sure is this, we all have gifts, we've all been given something by God to assist in this mission. Bench warming Christians don't exist. If you're on the bench warming it, it's not the Lord's bench. It's going to get hotter if you stay there. Bench-warming Christians don't exist. So how are you involved? Ask yourself. Pray. Ask God, how can I be involved in spreading your shalom, your peace with the gospel of peace? How can I help plant churches? How can I help establish missions and ministries that are going to bring the, restore, uh, the, the, uh, the shalom of Jesus Christ to people in my city, in my world. Live in radical generosity. How am I using my resources to, to bring shalom? Like, if your bank account could become a person, and I went to your bank account and said, hey, um, is so-and-so a Christian? Would your bank account say, oh, definitely? Or would it say, I don't know. Seems like he, his money goes to, you know, sports and her money goes to makeup but there's nothing here that would indicate this person cares about spreading the gospel how are you using your money we're surrounded by brokenness and we have the only tool of repair don't be selfish don't keep it to yourself blessed are the soul winners for they shall be called sons of god blessed are the peacemakers People ask me sometimes, Alan, what's your favorite Bible verse? It's, it's hard for me to answer that question because there's so many good ones. But one that really impacts me pretty deeply is found in the book of Daniel. 
It's right at the end of book, and Daniel is visited by a divine messenger who tells him about what's going to happen at the end of time. And, and then he says this. The messenger speaking to Daniel says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise, there's the word, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And, and check this out. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the stars forever and ever. Every time I look up at the stars, this passage rings in my ears. There's nothing worth doing in this life more than this, than turning many to righteousness, turning many to Christ, our hope and our righteousness. Whenever I get discouraged, I remember those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. The stars, those massive flaming balls of heat that could, some of them, engulf our whole solar system. God says you will be established firm forever like that. But for now, we live in a broken world and we have a lot of work to do. A Christian rapper named Seven said in one of his songs, Hang with us, you cannot stand around no mo. You are not in Kansas now, Toto. No more standing around. If you're hanging with the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no standing around no more. You're not in Kansas anymore. You're on a, you're on, you're on a battlefield. You're on a mission. If you're a child of God in a broken world, there's no standing around. It's time to labor in soul winning. And let me just give this as a, just for clarification's sake. When I, when I talk about labor and working and soul winning, listen, we can't win anyone to the Lord like Jesus does it. But he commands us, go and speak my word. Go and love your neighbors. Go and labor. And for some reason, he's chosen us and using our little feeble attempts to change eternity. But all the glory goes to him forever and ever. He that wins souls is wise and shall shine like the brightness of the stars forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have made peace between us and God. We thank you that you shed your blood for us 2,000 years ago and that you defeated death. I pray that you would begin to conjure up in us the spirit of peace, that you would give us sacrificial uh, love for one another, that we would begin to uh, sacrifice our time, our comforts, our money for you and for the sake of your people. Call in your elect, O oh God. Regenerate the hearts of your people that we might fulfill your word and so live in your peace. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, everyone. Well, that concludes our worship time. Go out from this place and make some peace. Amen? All right, stick around. Have some cookies. Have some water. Have some coffee. Have some cake. And have a great Sunday.